I'm going to talk about clinical research update. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, four separate topics. Um, all right. One is recently reported clinical trials. One is mole molecules that are currently in development. One is some trials in pediatric PAH. And last are, which people always ask, how about stem cells in PAH? And um, just to be transparent, the, in the first two, the ones I picked were the ones I picked. They may not be what somebody else would pick, but these are molecules or trials that I found interesting um, or had unexpected findings or at least in the molecules in development have different mechanisms of action than drugs that are currently available, okay? And we can argue at the end during the question and answer period whether you like those or not or whether you wanted something else approved, but basically right now this is my sandbox, so these are my toys. So first I'm gonna talk about the INCREASE trial, which is <clears throat> A, was a 16-week multicenter randomized placebo-controlled trial of inhaled traprostanol in patients who had pulmonary hypertension associated with interstitial lung disease. So this is group three PAH, according to Patty's scale. And it enrolled over 300 patients. And the interstitial lung disease could be multiple different etiologies. Patients could be on background antifibrotic therapy including patients with connective tissue disease associated interstitial lung disease, but they had to have an FVC of less than 70% or predicted to try and uh, eliminate those people who had true PAH. So in general, the patients that were recruited out of these 300 plus patients had an FVC of 63% or predicted and a DLCO of 30% or predicted, which probably affects the pulmonary hypertension. They had a pretty low six minute walk of about 260 meters and they qualified as having pulmonary hypertension by the standard criteria. They were treated with inhaled traprostanol at the standard dose, although you could go up to as much as 12 breaths per session. Uh, at the end of the trial, 16 weeks, there were 35 discontinuations in both groups. So that's about 70 people. Um, so you were left with about 250 people. And the discontinuations were for relatively equal reasons, including deaths. The primary endpoint, which was placebo collected six, corrected six minute walk test was positive. So it was positive at 21 meters at peak dose and 15 meters at trough dose. And then if you used mixed repeated measurements, it was positive at 31 meters. So the primary endpoint was hit. And in a forest plot that came with it, there people who did better seemed to be those who got more breaths per session, i.e. above nine. Those who had a PBR that was higher at baseline, four woods units possibly reflecting that they had pulmonary hypertension, had a lower six minute walk at baseline, i.e. more debilitated. Those who had uh, idiopathic interstitial pneumonitis and those who are female. Interestingly, again, in this study, as has been seen in other studies, males tend to do worse than females because obviously females are tougher. And along with hitting the primary endpoint, there was an improvement in NT pro BNP by about 38%. There was a reduction in the time to clinical worsening of 39% overall. So there were events in 23% of the patients who received the inhaled traprostanol and 33% of those who got placebo. There was no change in mortality. There were four deaths in each of the two groups and there was no change in patient recorded outcomes. But the study used the St. George questionnaire, which has really been devised for COPD. So I'm not really sure that it's apropos for patients with interstitial lung disease. Uh, the AEs, as you would expect, were the same you would get with inhaled traprostanol. So there were no new signals as far as side effects go. One thing that is surprising and part of the thing I think is fascinating about this study is the fact that they measured uh, PFTs before 
and at the end of 16 weeks. And there was a statistically significant improvement in the FVC and the people who got inhaled triprosinol, 40, 44 cc's actually, which is not inconsequential, which is at some level what has been obtained with antifibrotics. Why that is, we don't know yet. So overall, in sum, this study showed that inhaled tray imp improved functional capacity, hemodynamics, and biomarkers in people who had pulmonary hypertension associated with interstitial lung disease, i.e. group three PH. And there was this surprising finding or this unexpected finding of improvement in the forced vital capacity. And in those patients, most of these people were taking antifibrotic agents already. The thing that I think that's important and potentially exciting about this is this is the first robust randomized control trial that shows efficacy of any of our quote PAH meds in group three PH. Um, obviously, if you look at all the data that I had available to me and the forest plots, there were groups that had better responses than others. And there may be that within the ILD group, there are, are patients that benefit more from this than others. That'll be worked out as the data comes out. But certainly um, something we have not had before, a potential drug for group three pH. And I know they've either filed or will file uh, with the FDA for this indication. The second study I'm gonna talk about is Triton, which uh, is a was a 26 week multi-center randomized placebo controlled trial in patients with group one PAH. So there's 247 patients in this. And it looked at either Massitentin and Vitalovil together up front, adding Selexapeg or placebo, and these were all newly diagnosed incident patients who were treatment naive. And the patients continued unblinded therapy until the last patient completed the trial. So the trial actually took a little bit of time. So you were, you were eligible if you were 18 to 75 years old, if you had most of the usual things that go into clinical trials in PAH. Uh, liver disease was excluded as is usual. Uh, in general, the patients in this trial had a mean pulmonary artery pressure of about 50, a right atrial pressure of about eight, a cardiac index of around 2.1, and a PVR of around 12 wooden units. For those of you who do it the other way, it's about 960 dynes, a little under 1,000. And their six minute walk was uh, impaired at 350 meters. There were 14 people who discontinued from the triple therapy group and 20 from the placebo group. Interestingly, there were two deaths in the triple group and nine in the group that got placebo. So they got just two drugs. Uh, the median follow-up was about 75 weeks. So we're talking about a year and a half here. The primary endpoint, which was PBR, there was no difference in the reduction of PVR, 54% in the triple therapy group and 52% in the people who got two drugs and placebo. And likewise, there was no, there was no difference in BNP, six minute walk, or functional class worsening. So those were all the same, whether you got three drugs up front or two drugs up front. However, which is really interesting and sort of unexpected based on that is that there was a 41% risk reduction in the people who got triple therapy versus those who got placebo. And it was the usual conglomeration of risk reduction markers that's been used in multiple recent trials. But in this case was driven by death, two versus nine, and hospitalizations 10 in the triple group and 19 in the people who got two drugs on a placebo. Uh, the AEs were as expected for the drugs that were used in this, there were no new signals and the discontinuations 
were similar other than the ones I just mentioned, death and hospitalization, which really accounted for most of the risk reduction. So in sum, at least adding selexapeg to mastitentin and to dalafil up front in group one treatment naive patients resulted in no difference in functional capacity, hemodynamics, or biomarkers. However, this marked reduction in risk with triple therapy is really interesting. Has not yet been explained. The data is still being looked at. And for, mo for at least the moment, should be considered exploratory. And why it happened or what it represents is unclear. Maybe it has to do with the fact that there was a marked difference in hospitalization, which we know changes pretty much everything as far as outcomes. But I look forward to figuring, to having this figured out, because this is actually potentially interesting and may mean that some of the endpoints that we've used in trials before may not actually be uh, uh, sensitive enough to pick up differences in drugs. Okay, the third trial I want to talk about is Pulsar, which Hap. was a- Hey, Hap, may I yeah. ask a quick question just from the, yes. you know, um, when you say blinded, like, um, you know, what, what does that mean when you're talking about clinical trial that's blinded? Um, so blinded help means- Help us with that, some of the terms. Okay, so blinded means that there's a pill, or and usually in this case, a pill that's created that looks like just just like the average, the active agent, okay, and the patient gets that, and neither the patient, the or nor the the investigator knows whether it's active drug or it's like sugar pills, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that you're taking the same amount of medicine in both groups, uh, you're taking the same number of pills, really, and nobody presumably knows what you're taking, although. In some cases, that's not true because if drugs have very specific side effects, you can often guess whether they're getting actual drug or placebo, although you're usually wrong. And, and happened a very basic way. How did they actually assess risks of the patients that were involved for all the patients that are on the line? They, how did they assess what? How did they assess risk and risk reduction? So it was risk reduction in that you combined factor of, you know, hospitalization, death, transplant, uh, need to go on systemic prostanoids, um, greater than 15% decrease in six minute walk plus decrease in uh, functional class, the usual. So, so by using that really compact cumulative uh, endpoint, it probably was a little bit of everything that summated into this risk it, reduction. It certainly could be, yeah. and that needs to be investigated. Okay, got it. Uh, uh, this is, you know, these a lot of these data, to be honest with you, have not been completely released, or I didn't have access to all the data. I put together a lot of these data from different sources because. Uh, for proprietary reasons, uh, the companies couldn't share the data yet. All right, so Pulsar is a 24 week, was a 24 week randomized double blind placebo controlled trial of Ceteratef, which is actually a completely new molecule, which we'll get to at the end, added to background therapy in patients with group one PAH. This is a phase two study of 106 patients. So these were functional class two or three. They had a six minute walk somewhere between 150 and 550. And they had to have a PBR of greater than five woods units. So that's substantial entry criteria. And they used the standard PAH categories. They did not include HIV or liver disease. And you could be on either monotherapy, double therapy, or even triple therapy, including systemic or IV therapy as background. Uh, and then you got Ceteracept either at the, one of those two doses, a lower dose, 0.3 milligrams per kilogram, or 0.7 milligrams per kilogram, given subcutaneously every three weeks. Interestingly, 55% of the patients in the study were on triple therapy. Um, the PVR of those that were entered was roughly about 10 Woods units, so that's about 800 dynes, 
and the six minute walk was just under 400 meters. So the primary endpoint, as in a lot or most phase two trials was the reduction in PVR and it was statistically significant for both doses, the 0.3, which was a little over 20%, and the 0.7, which was a little under 34%. Um, if you look at a force plot for the 0.7% for the 0.7 milligram per kilogram dose, all subgroups, uh, it was successful except males and connective tissue disease where it crossed the origin. So once again, males did not do as well as females. Um, and this is, it sounds like a broken record, but this is in almost every clinical trial that's been done. Um, the six minute walk distance placebo corrected was 25 meters, which was statistically significant, or 37 meters in patients on triple therapy, which is actually very impressive and people are already on three drugs. And there was a 51% drop in the NT pro BNP, which was also statistically significant. And they used an interesting uh, multi-component improvement uh, metric, which is a little bit similar to what was used in the old AIR Isloprost trial, but with different parameters. So the three parameters were uh, increasing, improving, or keeping your functional class at two, uh, dropping your NT pro BNP by 30%, and increasing six minute walk by 30 meters. You had to have all three, and over a third, so 38% of the patients who got the Ceterocept actually achieved that. Uh, the AEs, since this is a new drug, the most common, there were a lot of the usual GI stuff and all that, but the most common that were different than placebo were thrombocytopenia and an increase in hemoglobin, which are actually known to occur with the drug. But none of those really were dramatic. I have a couple questions real quick before you move on. When you say multi-component, what, what does functional class improvement mean? Um, so if you started as a functional class three. What does that mean? To so that functional class basically tells you what you can do or can't do without getting short of breath. So functional class one is you can run a marathon and don't get short of breath. <laughs> or bike New Zealand and don't get short of breath. <laughs> functional class two is you get short of breath doing, you know, exertional stuff. Functional class three um, is really doing, getting short of breath with, um, you know, your, act, your basic activities of daily living. And functional class four is being short of breath at rest and or having syncope. So since the people who were recruited into this study were either functional class two or three, none of them were technically uh, symptomatic at rest or had had syncope. And so they improved to where they could do, if, if you improve the functional class two, where you can do your activities of daily living reasonably comfortably. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. So, in sum, this is really a promising phase two trial of a completely new molecule with a novel um, um, mechanism of action. So, it rebalances pro and anti proliferative BM sig BMP signaling pathways. Um, we're not going to go into the science of this unless we want to do it in the question and answer. But it's a, it's a very unique way to balance these out. And it's obviously different from any other PAH therapies that are out there or actually even being studied at the moment. So it is first in class. And it, uh, the phase three trials of the drug are currently being planned and should go into uh, business anytime soon. But this, uh, this is fairly exciting because should this pan out, this is a way to treat pulmonary hypertension outside of the uh, vasoreactive or vasomotor ways we have treated it in the past. And Hap, did you mention how the drug was taken? Yeah, it's taken, it's uh, given subcutaneously every three weeks. So that's like an injection under the skin, like when you do insulin. It's sort of like insulin, yep. Yeah. Interesting, huh?
I mean, what's been, what was really impressive to me in this phase two trial is the fact that patients could literally be on our current max therapy. Yeah, and they got better. therapy plus two other drugs, which you mentioned, and then you add this whole new agent. And like we saw, you know, in the prior trial where you were discussing Triton, you kind of lost a little bit of a signal when you added just a third drug to the two drugs. Like, but remember, therapy. Patty, these are different patients. These are patients on background therapy, whereas Triton were treatment naive. Oh, so fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. I don't know if you can compare those. Fair enough, fair enough. Head yeah. Head. But, but, but that the said, these were heavily you... treated patients Yeah. got a new drug and at least in the phase two trial, had very impressive clinical response. So I think most of us in the field uh, are looking, for, <laughs> really looking forward to what the phase three studies show. Great. Okay. <clears throat> so then I'm gonna talk about three emerging therapies. Hopefully these keep emerging. Um, most of these are just in early development, but I think they represent in a way what Cetericep does. They are going after different molecules or molecules that we have not gone after or pathways that we have not gone after in the past. And hopefully that uh, as Cetericep might show that what pulmonary hypertension ends up being is sort of like left heart failure. It's a cocktail of multiple different drugs that attack multiple different pathways, and each one added on improves people's uh, clinical status and hopefully their outcome. So the first one I'm going to talk about is clinical development of a tryptophan hydrolase TPH inhibitor. Okay, and I, I, as many times as I say wrote a free stat, I can't say it. Ethyl, I'm just calling it RE for the treatment of pulmonary arterial hypertension. So the phase 2B study is, anticipation, is anticipated to start early next year. So what's unique about this? Well, I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but the thing that's important is this basically blocks serotonin way, way up at the beginning. So it blocks cons conversion of tryptophan to serotonin. And there's been multiple studies in the past, including mostly with diet drugs and things like that, that have suggested that serotonin is important in development of PAH, in part because it's vasoconstrictive, but more so because it causes proliferation of smooth muscle. However, drugs that have affected the serotonin uh, receptors or transporters have failed. And it may be in part because the serotonin system, the transporters and the, and the receptors are so complicated that there are ways around blocking one or more than one. So this would block everything above. So you would get literally no serotonin and hopefully that would work. So they, um, as you can imagine, there is um, animal data, which I'm gonna show you. There's animal data to show that it works. Uh, both in knockout and knockdown animals. Um, there's um, a lot of data in humans, okay, especially with diet drugs with markedly elevated serotonin levels. And um, there are now uh, phase one data to show that this is at least seemingly safe in studies of uh, normal humans so far. So this TPH inhibitor, RE, is expected to go into uh, clinical trials at the beginning of next year, and we'll see how it does. So the second one I want to talk about is clinical development of inhaled GB002 for the treatment of PAH. Now, why is this one interesting? Well, this one's interesting for the simple reason that it is it affects the PDGF uh, receptor. PDGF is platelet-derived growth factor, and it has been shown in multiple studies in animals um, that PDGF seems to play a key role in pulmonary vascular remodeling. And in fact, we have data to show that affecting PDGF might actually be clinically effective, and that goes back to the imatinib trial. So imatinib, for those of you who don't know, or Gleevec, 
was a drug that was developed to treat uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia and was unbelievably successful. It basically changed the disease. So it is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, but it also inhibits the PDGF receptor. Um, the trials that were done with it, there were two trials. The, the last trial, the IMPRESS trial, actually was positive. There were both hemodynamic and clinical improvements. However, the drug was not approved because of safety and tolerability issues, some of which were unexpected. So this, GBO2, is a small molecule inhibitor of the PDGF receptor with a improved kinase, kinase inhibition profile that's formulated as a dry powder inhaler. So hopefully it goes to the place where you need it the most and it eliminates or mitigates the potential side effects that were associated with long-term rimatinib use in patients with PAH. And like the previous molecule, it's been evaluated in preclinical models. It's shown improvement in animals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in phase one studies, it has a favorable pharmacokinetic profile and was well tolerated. And it's just about to launch its phase two clinical trial in patients with group one PAH. So this also is very exciting because those of us who um, were in the imatinib trials, and me especially since we actually had the second patient in the world reported who had a positive outcome with imatinib, um, this may get around all the safety and tolerability of issues of imatinib and be as effective, which we know imatinib was, or even more effective. So this is sort of the outline. They, the company is now into launching the phase two trial uh, in the second half of 2020, probably delayed a little because of COVID, but should start up uh, relatively soon. All right. And then the last molecule I want to talk about is clinical development of a VIP analog, uh, PB1046, for the treatment of PAH. Um, so it's currently enrolling, it's phase two study. So it's a 16 week multi-center randomized, double-blinded, placebo controlled, uh, controlled phase two study to assess the safety, tolerability, and efficacy of this molecule, PB1046, which is an analog of VIP. So VIP is vasoactive is vaso intestinal peptide, which does a lot of things. It, works on your vessels, it's anti, it works on inflammation, et cetera. It, um, it had a trial way, way back, um, probably now 20 years ago, a small trial in which VIP given to patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension actually did clinically improve them. Uh, then it had a sort of larger trial that was negative, but there were questions about the um, actually the drug itself at that point. So this is a little bit different in that it binds to the receptor. So it's administered subcutaneously once a week. So this is again, sort of like insulin, but given once a week. And the trial is currently randomizing. So it's a two to one ratio with a low dose that's titrated up and then a higher dose that's sort of kept the same with a sham of titration so that you don't know which dose you're getting. Um, the primary endpoint is PVR, and the secondary endpoints are the usual six-minute walk and NT Pro BNP with a whole bunch of endpoints, including other hemodynamic parameters and changes in Borg Disney index, uh, quality assurance, um, I mean quality uh, metrics and functional class. So also another interesting way to target this and also an interesting way to deliver drug in that we've some of these we've moved away now to subcutaneous intermittent object injections um, the only time we've used subcutaneous drugs so far obviously subcutaneous traprostinol but that's a continuous infusion so these subcutaneous intermittent injections might get away from the issues of site pain they do probably because it's less drug given less frequently 
okay? And we'll see what happens with these three um, emerging drugs. So for the rest of the little bit of the talk, I wanna talk a little bit about clinical research in pediatric PAH. So there's been a recent publication in pulmonary circulation about using oral triprosanol in transition <laughs> as add-on therapy in pediatric PAH. These are 32 children who were on background therapy. <laughs> they were about, average age was about 12, and oral triprosanol was added to their background therapy or substituted for IV or inhaled tray, and they had a 90, about a 97% success rate in remaining on oral tray, which is really good. Um, granted, it's a small study. That wasn't a witticism. <laughs> it's a small number, but then clinical trials in children are usually smaller and harder to do. Um, and um, it's everybody obviously got drug. This is not placebo controlled. Uh, there are two other ongoing pediatric clinical trials out there. One is called Tomorrow, which is massitentin dosing in pediatric PAH. And the other is called Salto, which is Solexapeg in pediatric PAH. And we will await the results of those. Obviously, for a lot of reasons, ethical numbers, et cetera, um, clinical trials in children are really hard to do. Okay, so any data that look positive is good. And then lastly, I wanna talk about stem cells for the treatment of PAH. In one word, it's a complete ripoff. It's a total sham. Now there are a lot of, there are a lot of scientific studies to suggest that you might be able to put stem cells into your pulmonary circulation or into your right ventricle to improve PAH, but there are absolutely no clinical data to show that stem cells uh, are, as of yet, do have been successful in treating pH. That said, there are numerous of these clinics, mostly in Florida, actually, uh, who will harvest your stem cells for God knows how much re money and then re-inject them in you to your supposed stem cells to treat your pH. And of course, they all have testimonials that, you know, I was near death. I got my stem cells back and now I ran a marathon. Um, so I would advise any of the patients who, who are on this call, if you see any ad for stem cells for treatment for PAH, it is a sham. Do not pay the money. You are getting nothing in return. But if you see, question, quick question on that, if there are stem cell research trials. Well, that's a different issue. Okay. But there are none yet because it's still science. It's still basic science. So um, the only thing that's close is the, the trial in Canada in which they uh, reprogram your endothelial cells with um, nitric oxide and then re-inject them into you. So, and that's only to show safety so far. And it's only enrolled so far, I think, about 10 patients. So this is... Hopefully, something that in the future will pan out, but as of right now, do not get involved in this, unless it's from a reputable place. A newspaper ad or um, on social media is not going to get it. Um, and I think that's it. I'm done. So Great. thank you, everybody. Great. Pap, I'm going to jump in. We've got a lot of good questions that came up. And just so it stays fresh in people's mind, okay. um, I'm going to follow your advice and do a little Q&A right now with you off of your um, clinical talk. All right. So um, I'm going to go in reverse order here. So one, um, Emma from Mexico City asked, is, are there any records that these trials are done in her country, in Mexico? Some of the trials that you mentioned are that do you know if they were in Mexico or in other countries for that matter? I mean, a lot of them were done uh, in multiple sites outside the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have in front of me specifically which ones were or were not done in Mexico, but we can certainly find out for her. Okay, great. Here's a big question that came from multiple people. With, um, <laughs> are there any, with the drug that blocks serotonin, are there any concerns that that will cause depression? Yep. I'm depressed just thinking about it. No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, yeah, but 
as seemingly not not much because the advantage of the RE drug here is it doesn't cross your blood brain barrier. Okay, so your serotonin is still active in your brain. So unless you affect the serotonin in your brain, you're probably not going to get depressed. Okay. It's interesting because some people talk about uh, gut uh, hormones and gut effects and how that can affect. Well, it might be because most of your serotonin at least is made in your gut now. I mean, yeah. now. Fascinating. Um, quick question. Just when you say hemo, hemodynamic improvements, you're meaning like improvement of their calf numbers, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Anytime you mention the word hemodynamics, it's not in these trials. It's it's done with a right heart cath. It's not done off an echo. Okay, great. Um, and here's a here's a great question. So, do you think that the studies are truly blinded, considering that at some point patients and investigators can presume who are taking placebo because of side effects, for example? Um, do you think that in the like in real world research, will will, will we have to somehow change that? Um, and, and how good are we at guessing whether people are on placebo or something? No, it's actually a great question, and it's always been brought up. And um, actually, as it turns out, um, it's you would think that if you're getting a placebo and the active drug has specific side effects, you would know that you're getting active drug, either you or the investigator. It turns out because of placebo or nocebo effects, i.e. if I tell you that the side effects you're going to get with this drug are X, Y, and Z, oft times, much more often than we think, even if I give you a placebo, you get X, Y, and Z. Okay, it's just your brain telling you, aha. So um, there are some studies that have looked at this, okay, um, and it turns out, and if you look at most of the clinical trials, most of the side effects, except those that are really specific to a drug, are the same in the placebo group and in the um, treated group. So that there is an overlap. I think in general, um, it's, it's, it's rigorous enough. There's really not enough data to show that people can figure out what, whether they're actually getting active drug or, or placebo. Got it. And um, thank you. And, and that's also important, right? Because when you're talking about people improving their six minute walk distance or their functional class, you're comparing that person to like somebody who's on the dummy pill or the placebo. The that's sugar a placebo pill. placebo adjusted difference. <clears throat> yeah. One final uh, question, I think, before we move on is what was the final dose of Celexapec in Triton? The final average dose achieved, do you know? Um, I'd have to go back and look, but I, it was above 1,200. I think it was around 1,200. Great. All right. So with that, I think I've seen all of the questions and hopefully answered them from the first talk. If you guys have more questions, we'll, there'll be opportunities to ask them later, but we'll move on now.